Allora, buongiorno, ben arrivati a tutti i nostri amici partner europei di questo progetto e tutti quanti gli altri che interessati a questo convegno che sono eh, gli ospiti del museo. Prima di incominciare i lavori vorrei presentarvi il nuovo direttore del polo museale del Lazio. Voi sapete che il Museo Pigliolini è confluito recentemente in una struttura eh, più vasta che eh, raccoglie tutti quanti i musei della regione Lazio. E la dottoressa Elit Gabrielli è il direttore di questo polo eh, che unisce 43 istituti eh, museali e credo che abbia piacere di salutarvi e di darvi il benvenuto. Passo la parola a lei. Grazie e buongiorno a tutti. Il 4 dicembre del 2014 in Piemonte, precisamente nel capoluogo a Torino, è stata inaugurata la Galleria Sabauda nella nuova sede della Manica Nuova di Palazzo Reale. Che cos'è la Sabauda? Lo dico per quei colleghi che non hanno consuetudine con il mondo della storia dell'arte. È una delle principali pinacoteche statali italiane. Le sue origini possono farsi risalire fino alla seconda metà del Cinquecento, quando i Savoia, la dinastia che poi avrebbe dato i futuri re d'Italia, spostò la capitale del proprio ducato a Torino e cominciò a collezionare in modo massiccio opere d'arte. La data ufficiale, tuttavia, di apertura della galleria è il 1832, quando Carlo Alberto di Savoia decide appunto di aprire le collezioni della propria famiglia al pubblico. Da allora la Galleria Sabauda ha avuto tre sedi, la prima quella scelta da Carlo Alberto nel Palazzo Madama di Torino, nel, nella piazza principale, Piazza Castello, successivamente il Palazzo dell'Accademia delle Scienze proprio al di sopra del Museo Egizio, che sicuramente tutti voi avete visto nella, nella storia economica italiana una figura di tutto rispetto diciamo, eh, da, porre, da porsi accanto a um, figure come Giovanni Agnelli di cui fu in parte partner e antagonista. Ebbene Riccardo Gorino fu anche un grande collezionista di opere d'arte che nel 1930, quindi in un'epoca estremamente precoce, donò allo Stato italiano e in particolare alla Galleria Sabauda. Il tema che ci abbiamo dovuto affrontare era appunto come trattare la collezione Gualino. In passato essa era stata relegata all'epoca degli oggetti collezionati, quindi vista in modo assolutamente del passato. La nostra scommessa, l'idea forte del nuovo allestimento, è stata invece concepire la collezione Gualino esattamente al contrario, cioè come un'espressione del collezionista che l'ha formata e quindi di quell'epoca e di quell'ambiente culturale cui il collezionista apparteneva, la Torino degli anni 20 e 30, di qui un allestimento museale che ha inserito la, la collezione Guadina nel percorso cronologico della galleria e lo ha, ha messo a confronto le opere della Guadino con altre opere di arte contemporanea eseguita negli anni 20 e 30 che non erano appartenute a Guadino ma che avevano fatto parte dell'universo figurativo di Guadino in particolare quelli dei sei eh, di Torino quindi in questo modo la collezione Guadino è stata veramente eh, interpretata come un affaccio delle collezioni dinastiche dei Savoia sul mondo contemporaneo di ieri, oggi e domani eh, si tratta di uno dei temi chiave del museo e non solo lasciatemelo dire da storico dell'arte per le due parti in causa, ovvero il mondo dell'antropologia e il mondo dell'arte contemporanea, ma per tutti i musei, perché tutti i musei non importa quale sia il loro contenitore né quale sia il loro contenuto, sono contemporanei, laddove il pubblico cui si rivolgono è il pubblico di oggi e quindi essi devono cambiare, modularsi, sintonizzarsi appunto con questo pubblico, cambiando i propri strumenti di comunicazione. Questo non altro è l'anima della nuova museologia e questo è appunto quello che abbiamo sperimentato 
fino a pochi mesi fa in occasione della preparazione della nuova Galleria Sabauda. Vorrei tuttavia aprire un poco di più il discorso, così da far capire meglio cosa sia e cosa voglia fare il polo museale del Lazio, di cui da appena due mesi il Museo Pigorini fa parte. La rete web e ancor prima le regole del moderno turismo culturale sono stati due fattori che hanno cambiato totalmente il moderno approccio ai musei ed è successo nel giro di appena una generazione. Un qualsiasi museo di oggi si pone il tema di rispondere in modo convincente a questi fattori, ripeto, la rete da un lato e il turismo culturale dall'altro, nel rispetto, lo speriamo tutti, della propria identità e della propria missione. Per questo, non per altro, è sorto il polo museale del Lazio. Ci sono molte persone che vengono da fuori e quindi mi sembra giusto spiegare esattamente che cosa sia. Il Polo Museale del Lazio, come ha anticipato Egidio Cossa, è una nuova struttura che è nata in seguito alla riforma del nostro Ministero, il Ministero dei Beni, le Attività Culturali e del Turismo, voluta dall'attuale Ministro Dario Franceschini. Una struttura che nasce per gestire e valorizzare tutti i musei statali di una determinata regione, nel nostro caso appunto il Lazio, e ancora più importante a mio avviso, creare una rete, coordinare l'attività di questi musei statali con quella degli altri musei presenti nello stesso territorio, indipendentemente da quale sia la loro proprietà. Quindi ci rivolgiamo anche ai musei dei comuni, delle province, della regione, cioè di quelli che noi chiamiamo enti locali e anche ai musei privati, con l'obiettivo di creare un vero e proprio sistema museale nazionale. Grazie alla dottoressa Gabrielli per questo suo saluto e per questa sua informativa su, anche sul lavoro che ha fatto precedentemente a Torino eh, realizzando e riaprendo di strutture museali chiuse da eh, tempo immemorabile. Eh, ora veniamo al nostro incontro tipo di oggi. Eh, questo eh, incontro di oggi eh, è il primo eh, incontro, il primo meeting eh, all'interno di questo progetto eh, europeo che con questo acronimo si chiama SWITCH, quindi Sharing a World of Inclusion, eh, Creativity and Heritage. Eh, questo progetto vede come i precedenti a cui il Museo Pinguini ha partecipato la eh, presenza dei più importanti istituti eh, culturali che si dedicano alle culture extraeuropee e eh, ai etnografiche d'Europa. Eh, questo permette un continuo interscambio di eh, informazioni e di esperienze che naturalmente nell'ottica di questi progetti dovrebbe portare alla creazione di un network e quindi un miglioramento, una maggiore apertura, un ampliamento degli spettatori, dei pubblici che eh, vengono affascinati, attratti dalle eh, nostre collezioni. Uh, questo, mh, questo progetto, come dicevo, è la mh, naturale eh, prosecuzione dei progetti precedenti eh, ai quali moltissimi eh, partner presenti oggi hanno aderito, eh, che sono i eh, progetti, eh, vado in ordine cronologico inverso, Redmi 2, cioè il Réseau Européen des Associations de Diaspora et Musée Ethnographique che si è svolto dal 2010 al 2012 e che eh, si è concluso con una mostra eh, realizzata al Museo Rigorini dal titolo Soggetti Migranti, ehm, che in qualche modo cioè, tipo, era ehm, la chiusura come dire, espositiva, una restituzione ai, al pubblico, eh, almeno della città di Roma, di questo, di questo progetto. Uh, naturalmente all'interno di questo progetto ci furono uh, workshop, incontri, conferenze, cioè ogni istituto partecipante a questi progetti aveva realizzato <coughs> delle attività specifiche uh, all'interno della, della propria struttura. 
precedentemente dal 2008 al 2013 eh, ci fu questo progetto RIME, Réseau International des Musées et Ethnographie, eh, sempre patrocinati dal programma cultura dell'Unione Europea, ehm, che aveva sottolineato, eh, messo al centro della propria attenzione, eh, i rapporti del, mh, del, di questi musei con le comunità diasporiche presenti all'interno dei, eh, dei propri paesi. Anche questo, il cui capofila fu eh, il Museo Royal de la Fille Centrale del Carburen, eh, terminò con una mostra itinerante che toccò gran parte delle sedi dei eh, musei partecipanti dal titolo eh, emblematico Fetish Fetish Modernity. Uh, precedentemente ancora, dal 2007 al 2009, ci fu la prima edizione di Redmi, uh, sempre patrocinata e comunque promossa dal Museo Royal della Fille Centrale, insieme al Museo di Chedron Lee e tanti tipo altri, uh, e il Museo Figolini realizzò in quell'occasione un atelier scientifico dal titolo Museo e Diaspora, Maschere e Identità Plurali. Ma il Museo Pigolini è eh, come dire, un, un vecchio frequentatore di questi progetti eh, interculturali, precedentemente c'è un progetto mosaico patrocinato e coordinato dal Ministero dei Beni, delle Attività Culturali e del Turismo eh, e mh, in quell'occasione il Museo organizzò questo, eh, questa, questa mostra eh, allestendo eh, quattro, come dire, mh, quattro parti dedicate alle singoli paesi, alle singole culture che avevano partecipato a questo progetto, quindi Marocco, Africa, America e Cina, eh, dal titolo Saperci fare educazione e ehm, comunicazione interculturale a, eh, al museo. Vabbè, questo elenco è, eh, proseguo ancora, ma veniamo tipo a noi, veniamo al, veniamo al progetto di oggi, questo uh, sweet, uh, switch, ehm, che in qualche modo vuole puntare um, la sua attenzione sulla uh, inclusione, cioè sulla, um, come dire, sulla uh, partecipazione degli artisti contemporanei in una nuova definizione, in una nuova percezione dei patrimoni che conserviamo nei nostri spazi. Questo è un, un imperativo per, perché i nostri materiali sono dei materiali in qualche modo datati, che provengono, che sono arrivati nelle nostre collezioni, diciamo tipo tra la fine dell'Ottocento e i primi del Novecento, e che hanno in qualche modo bisogno di essere rivisitati, eh, rivisitati per non trasformarsi in semplici materiali di una realtà ormai passata e non più attuale, cioè per non trasformare in musei di etnografia, in musei di archeologia, abbiamo bisogno in qualche modo cioè, di eh, rivisitare, cioè, di ridefinire queste, eh, questi, questi patrimoni che noi eh, conserviamo. Ehm, il progetto eh, Switch eh, affronta in grosso modo questo, questo, questa problematica, ma naturalmente non solo, eh, c'è tutta una serie di eh, aspetti che vanno in qualche modo affrontati e che saranno affrontati da uno o più partner eh, che in qualche modo saranno consociati nella realizzazione di un, eh, di un prodotto terminale finito su un aspetto specifico di queste diverse problematiche. Eh, il, progetto, il progetto Switch, eh, a differenza dei precedenti, è eh, coordinato e diretto dal Museo di Vienna, dal Weltmuseum di Vienna, eh, cui oggi noi abbiamo il direttore e la, eh, la vice direttrice. Eh, dicevo, ciascun museo... Eh, associato con, con altri affronta un particolare aspetto, un particolare problema. Quali sono questi problemi che verranno in qualche modo eviscerati, si cercherà di dare una eh, risposta e una, ehm, come dire, una, una, una eh, fare chiarezza 
in questo, in questo, in questo progetto sono la, il concetto di cittadinanza e di appartenenza voi sapete tutti che eh, a partire dal 2001 con eh, il, famoso, il famoso volume eh, Unpacking Europe si mise eh, in, in, in dubbio, cioè si mise in crisi questo concetto di Europa come una entità monolitica di cultura e di popoli. Eh, questo, 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 questo volume rivoluzionario, in qualche modo, cioè, chi ha messo in discussione per primo eh, cioè una realtà consolidata fino a quel momento, per cui si parlava appunto cioè, tipo dell'Europa come un blocco unitario, eh, mette in dubbio quanto siano infondati e autoreferenziali eh, i concetti appunto di Europa e di europeo come entità di identità pure, invia, in, invitando a rileggere le tradizioni locali. The uh, English translations, which are also uh, in the uh, English speaking history of art, except the titles uh, Box in a Suitcase, which is a collection, of course, uh, of 69 of his uh, own works in miniature, including the famous Bright's Trip Bear of a Bachelor's, a, a kind of portable uh, museum, um, also uh, reproduced in, in many versions. And then, of course, uh, famously, Marcel Brock has the Belgian artist uh, with his uh, uh, museum, uh, artist museum department of eagles. And there are many other examples, but these are perhaps two of the most uh, notorious ones. Um, closer to anthropology, if you like, I will talk for a moment uh, about the work of uh, Christian Boltanski, who at the beginning of the 1970s, um, has uh, invited people at uh, art museums to construct their own private museums. Basically, he got in touch uh, with the gallery owners or the uh, people hosting his exhibitions. And uh, uh, we have a, a letter from him which explains that. Um, this work in particular, but he did it in Oxford, but uh, he uh, did this in many cities throughout uh, Europe. And um, he writes there, at the beginning of January 1973, I wrote to the directors of 62 art history and art anthropology museums suggesting they arrange an exhibition which would consist of all the available objects that a given individual has had around him during his lifetime, from handkerchiefs to cupboards. I asked them to concern themselves with such things as classification and labeling, but not with the choice of the person. They were to acquire the object through an auction or by borrowing them from someone living in their area. The person concerned should always remain anonymous. Pieces of furniture as well as small objects under glass should be carefully arranged to a certain order or in some cases a photographic inventory could be compiled. Um, so this is very important. What Boltanski basically does is to dissociate the, the objects from their individual owners. Yeah? You don't know any longer in this collection of personal items whom they originally belong to. Yeah? And it gives a very eerie feeling. <laughs> Just imagine you're walking through the, uh, 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 through the exhibition rooms of a big museum of Victoria and Albert or uh, indeed of one of these museums here in the area and you're suddenly confronted with your own toothbrush or a very personal item exhibited there that doesn't bear you any longer. Yeah. And I think the implications are already obvious for what uh, kind of objects we often have in ethnographic collection. And only in more recent times has there been an enormous effort, of course, uh, to challenge the, as it were, the anonymization which has been part of a certain colonial history, in part, and, and collecting practices. Yeah. Not overall, not too core, but, uh, but uh, of course uh, uh, this has been uh, part of our history. Now this kind of implicit critique Boltanski is voicing at the, uh, at the um, 
uh, in the early 70s, of course, was taken up by museum anthropologists, but quite a bit later, and not with reference, obviously, to contemporary art. If you think of that uh, seminal uh, work, uh, um, uh, turning point, really, um, Watershed uh, volume of uh, exhibiting cultures by Carp and Levi. Um, so uh, this is a point that, um, it, um, which I think we have to insist upon uh, here, and that, that's uh, one of the bases of why I have been engaged in this field of uh, bringing uh, contemporary arts and anthropology. I'm not as such a museum specialist, but the implications I think are obvious. Into dialogue is that, of course, the contemporary arts are not just uh, about material objects. They are as much about the conceptual work, about the processes which go into it. And therefore, in terms of contacts, of paradigms, of ways of thinking, are very important to get engage with uh, from the side of uh, anthropology and of course also of that part of anthropology uh, uh, which concerns itself with uh, museums. Because what happens here, uh, arguably, is that the museum effect uh, of which Alpha spoke, the museum object uh, effect is that where all objects are turned, as it were, into works of art in some way, at least in art museums, and um, is turned around in the sense that in artist museums the works of art uh, become museum objects. Yeah, so they're works of art already, but they get museumized, if you like, uh, uh, through this procedure. Uh, so this is what I have uh, to say um, uh, initially uh, about Boltanski and, and the most obvious, uh, perhaps, relations of um, con contemporary and, and mo modern and contemporary artists who have engaged with the idea of museum. I can do this here, of course, only in a very, uh, only in a very cursory uh, matter. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is interesting here as a historical point is that Artists' critique, as it were, of the museum, uh, also, as I will explain later, artist engagement with fieldwork sometimes has preceded anthropology's own reflective mood, uh, arguably by around a decade, I would say, yeah, between the late 60s and the early 70s. Yeah, I mean, we, we can argue about this, but uh, uh, I think there is something interesting to, to explore there. You know? So we have to take the epistemologies, the theoretical concerns of uh, artists uh, seriously. Theory is as much in the making and the material and research process um, as it is for anthropologists in books and articles. I will return to that. This has uh, obvious implications for the research work in museums itself, if we stay here for a moment. Um, in contrast uh, to anthropology, artistic appropriations, this is the next topic which is uh, of interest to me on, on which I've also worked in, I will not expound this further, but in theoretical terms, the, the, the concept of appropriation. Um, uh, in, um, in contrast to anthropology, at least academic anthropology, museum anthropology, again, is uh, slightly different. Mm -hmm. Artists don't work necessarily through the medium um, of uh, language, uh, through their training and sensibility and empathy for a large range of material working uh, techniques um, in the manufacture of art and artifacts, uh, artists appropriate through the material working process itself. Um, and they have a different uh, way, um, uh, different possibilities of participation in the production of artifacts in the field um, at the point um, or in, in those cases where artists uh, engage with field work. I have um, uh, worked on this in some more detail if you're interested in another in a monograph called Appropriation as Practice, Art and Identity in Argentina. It was published in 2006 and uh, where I've looked into the appropriation of indigenous cultures by contemporary uh, Argentine artists formed in Western traditions or art schools in, in Buenos Aires. Um, so we could also now look at some artists who engage uh, perhaps in what in anthropology we would call uh, research on 
uh, other cultures, and we find, in fact, some cases in the recent history of contemporary art, of uh, what one might call artist scholars. Um, amongst them are, on the one hand, if you, if those of you who are, which is one of my specialities, of course, Latin America, I'm not a, a scholar of pre-Columbian cultures, but we find some interesting crossovers there between arts, uh, contemporary arts and, and uh, research. Uh, one of them uh, was the late Linda Scheler, who participated in the famous Maya roundtables and workshops at the University of Austin, um, Texas, at the early 1970s and 80s. She was a very accomplished uh, artist herself and draftsman, and uh, contributed really to this, with many other, with a number of other people, to the decipherment of the Maya glyphs. Somebody else um, who's also in, in, um, included in, in our book, uh, Contemporary Art and Anthropology, with a contribution is Cesar Paternoster, an Argentine um, artist, found himself in New York, uh, himself a practitioner of minimalist art, who appreciated the Andean monumental architecture as abstract art and try to establish a genuine notion of abstractionism for the Incas viewed through the lens of uh, 20th century European abstract art all the way from uh, Kandinsky in the early 20th century um, art. And he published uh, two important uh, books, one a monograph, uh, uh, The Thread and the Stone, which was uh, uh, published by the University of Texas Press, and, and the other one, Abstraction, the Amerindian Paradigm, which was an exhibition at the uh, uh, Palace of Fine Arts in Brussels, I think, in 2000, which he curated. So there we have, um, this is his own work, where you can see how it's uh, uh, both part of uh, uh, minimalist uh, sculpture, but also uh, inspired by uh, his preoccupation with Andean art. Um, so, in a way, one can say, at least with these examples, that the visual arts, uh, I'm including, actually, of course, the moving image work, uh, visual anthropology, film, also address different parts of our sensorium. Uh, visual, tactile, haptic, which go beyond the written and imply different forms of cognition and knowledge. Um, so, uh, just as we already translate and interpret when writing ethnography, uh, so you can think here of uh, Clifford Geertz's writing and the later writing culture critique. So too in artistic works, which deal with other cultures, are uh, their material expressions not just reproduced, but put into a new context. Um, I will now uh, briefly look at some artists which have engaged with the uh, practice and notion of field work, which is of course, uh, if you like, the signature practice uh, of anthropologists, <laughs> uh, the long-term immersion into other cultures, learning the language, the, the ways of life, uh, interaction, and so forth. I will not uh, now go into the history of this at the um, different refashionings of, of field work from uh, Malinowski to the present day, but it is interesting that artists, again, from the late uh, 1960s to the uh, early uh, uh, 70s through the 80s have worked with this. And if you're further interested, I've written two sort of uh, articles on this. Uh, some of this is in the late books, but the, the article would be in Anthropology Today in 1993, The Art Diviners, and in the Journal of Material Culture in 1996, uh, Uneasy Relationships. Uh, contemporary art and anthropology. And what I looked into is a movement, one could say a movement from uh, which existed uh, from the late 60s to the early uh, 80s, uh, mainly French and German artists, uh, some American also, which were interested in traces, uh, traces of human remains of human activity, uh, remains of human activity, um, uh, also field work sometimes in terms of participant observation. Some of these were heavily um, theoretically influenced, uh, notoriously Lothar Baumgarten, of course, by French uh, structuralism. Uh, here, and, uh, a work where he uses uh, indigenous North American uh, uh, names on the rotunda of the Guggenheim Museum in New York, but also a conceptual work 
uh, a view of the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, but if you see the photograph, <laughs> slides not very good at the, the site, it's written forgotten collector. Uh, horizontally, uh, uh, vertically, uh, you, you see that. And uh, this is actually already from the 19th, uh, the photograph from the late 1960s. But then also artists like Rainer Wittenborn and Klaus Biegert, who engaged in fieldwork with indigenous communities, uh, famously in their James Bay project in uh, northern Canada, in Quebec, with the Cree uh, indigenous people who were threatened at the time by a huge hydroelectric uh, plant, uh, has lost none of its actuality, this work. And if you get access, which is difficult to get, of the huge uh, catalogue, the documentation produced, the catalogue by the Museum of Fine Arts in Montreal. It's, it's worthwhile uh, looking at this uh, project. Um, uh, so they collaborated here, for example, they are classifying together with three uh, elders uh, botanic uh, uh, samples from the area, and later in the catalogue one then finds them with uh, uh, European or Latin uh, botanic classifications and, and indigenous ones. Uh, and interestingly, this project this brings on to, almost to the present and uh, one area which I will, if I have time, touch upon a bit later, ethics. This project didn't open in one of the big North American museums, uh, the exhibition, but in a small local school uh, where the Cree live, and then moved to Montreal, San Francisco, etc. Yeah. Uh, so this was really done in collaboration uh, with the community our source communities. Another one uh, here is uh, Nicolas Lang, uh, Color Field from 1987. Lang has mainly uh, worked in uh, southern Australia, and then some of his works has also included um, uh, the, the very uh, complicated uh, history, if you like, and colonial history of uh, white uh, Aboriginal relations. I will not go further into this uh, now. Um. So artists contribute to the understanding of material and artistic practice in indigenous cultures uh, and of course also uh, to the uh, understanding and the criticism, if you like, critical uh, presentation of their uh, political and colonial and political uh, history. Artistic practices in fieldwork as a kind of practical uh, mimesis, a term from Michael Jackson, can serve to interpret physically embodied practices and the resulting artifacts in a way which is not possible through verbal discourse alone. For example, the anthropologist David Gus uh, learned the craft or art of basket weaving amongst the Yaguana of Venezuela, as you know, the lowland, uh, many lowland uh, Amerindian um, uh, people are, are, are famous for the abstract and geometric patterns uh, in their uh, uh, basketball or uh, in also other arts. But he took a non-verbal approach to learning, uh, learning the basket making together with the Yehuana himself, without which he could not have understood their myth. So again, it was beyond the practice, was the research practice beyond language through the making, yeah? uh, and through understanding the art that they would eventually tell him uh, uh, the uh, 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 myth. So for museum, I will not talk so much, which is not uh, really my uh, field so much about the museums, but it is clear, obviously, that the restoration process tells us something about the original process of manufacture, Already in the early 60s, uh, interestingly, the, the, the reference will be familiar for you. Robert Asher wrote an article about the imit imitative experiment in archaeology, and hence uh, a whole strain of experimental uh, archaeology came. Now, interestingly, Robert Asher, with whom we feature in the uh, in the last book uh, with an article, some reference by the experimental filmmaker Catherine Ramey, and also in the new book. Uh, called Experimental Film and Anthropology, which I've done with Caterina Pasqualino of the CNI in uh, Paris. Um, 
Robert Ashen started out as an archaeologist, collaborated with his mathematician, late wife mathematician Martha Asher, on the decipherment of the Kipu code of the uh, Inca. He's also an experimental uh, filmmaker and uh, makes uh, what's called cameraless uh, film, uh, directly drawing as uh, analog uh, animators do on celluloid. Yeah? So you see a direct scene here of uh, practices engaging with experimental archaeology, exhibition museums pra impl with implications for museum practices of restoration and experimental artistic work. Again, a scholar artist, yeah, somebody who bridges the two domains, just as Cesar Paternosco does. Okay, um, now how can we then, I, I've shown you some of these uh, paradigmatic cases, I think, with references of the, what I think are really two parallel histories, but they are crisscrossing each other, sometimes uh, uh, out of joint, if you like, of anthropology and uh, contemporary art. But how can we bring them into, if at all, into further dialogue? Now one thing is perhaps to look for a moment uh, at history, but only just very briefly. Um, and again, uh, uh, this is just a brief reference, but what is interesting here is the term which uh, historian of anthropology, James Clifford, has used when he spoke uh, about, and I show you here the, the title page of the first number, about that very interesting moment in um, anthropology art relations in the 1920s and 30s. And this is the group uh, around the journal Document in, in France, uh, by, uh, a journal led by uh, Georges Bataille, but including the German uh, anthropologist and art historian who had migrated to Paris, uh, Karl Einstein. Uh, and many others, uh, Michel um, and so Marcel Griot and so forth, many other contributors. There has been written a lot about it in the Anglo-Saxon world. Uh, James Clifford, early on, the historian of anthropology, wrote about this in The Predicament of Culture. And what I just want to retrieve from this, I will not go into the history, is, is one expression of his, which I've used several times because I find this interesting conceptually. He writes there, at this point, and he makes a particular reference there to Alfred Mitro and Georges Bataille, yeah? an anthropologist uh, uh, and, 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 and philosopher in this case, and, and writer. Uh, but he uh, speaks more generally about, he says, French ethnography was on, or anthropology was on speaking terms with the avant-garde of its day. Yeah? So th that is, I think, without making a normative demand. That is an interesting term to, uh, to recover. The speaking terms, and I think in each and any instance, and that goes for museum work as well. When you invite, and I direct myself direct, uh, directly now to my colleagues who work in museums, artists to collaborate with you, one has to uh, find out to gauge, as it were, the speaking terms. Yeah, it's like a hermeneutic field. And it can be, as what I've called in, in another article, an uneven hermeneutic field, because you come with different, uh, as it were, uh, preconditions in, in, into this, uh, if it is a dialogue, uh, into this conversation, if you like. Yeah? Uh, and, and this is interesting. Obviously, this has worked for some people, yeah? for a group of people who found themselves uh, in a project around this journal in 1920s and 30s Paris. This is not to revive surrealism. Here, yeah? it, it's interesting to look at this, uh, of how it was done and how people had this conversation. And other, perhaps slightly less known instance is uh, the journal a little bit late, well, actually almost contemporaneously, Mexican folk waves, yeah, which was published by Americans and uh, Mexicans, artists and anthropologists in Mexico City in the 1920s and uh, 30s, uh, amongst them the, the muralist Orozco, the anthropologist uh, couple, uh, uh, Robert uh, Redfield and uh, Martha Macbeth. I will not <laughs> forget now his wife's name, but the, the two of them, uh, Tina Modotti, uh, photographed in there and so forth. So uh, uh, that's another instance. So sometimes you, you find this. Uh, slightly more consolidated forms of uh, uh, 
of, of collaboration consolidated in the sense that they leave material or, or traces uh, of journals or other works, they are not one-time uh, interventions. Yeah? And I think this is very interesting for us to, uh, in a way to think with this uh, in, in, in the present. I've written about this, if, if you're interested, in a book which uh, Jay Ruby and Marcus Banks edited with Chicago in 2011. Um, and there's an article in there, Unfinished Dialogues, Notes Towards an Alternative History of Art and Anthropology. So, uh, so much for the history. Now, when we turn to the present, I think there is now, um, because of certain developments, both in anthropology and the contemporary arts, what I would call a certain climate of convergence, or at least there is again a possibility to engage in a conversation between the contemporary arts and anthropology. Um, and this is due to a number of um, factors. One would be um, that there has been an ethnographic turn, certainly in the arts, since the 1990s, Hal Foster, uh, in an article first published, it's, it's often mentioned uh, in his uh, collection, The Return of the Real, but actually was published by anthropologists first, by the Marcus and Myers volume on the traffic uh, culture in 1995, uh, has written about this. He has critically, um, as it were, appreciated um, the, uh, those artists who've engaged with ethnography. And sometimes he has spoken about artist envy from one side towards anthropological practices and anthropologist envy perhaps also towards artist practices. We can take that up in the discussion. Um, it, but he also said that perhaps some artists only did this for personal gain or to have another exposure in the art world. Uh, that has actually, and this has not been featured so much, invited quite a strong criticism by one of the artists against whom this was directed, René Green. And she has written, although this was published only in German, unfortunately, she has written quite a strong rejoinder to Foster, where at least for her part, he, she re rejects that kind of critique that this was only to promote her career. So this is not without criticism. In a later piece in 2010, which was published in our Between Art and Anthropology, George Marcus also looks back at this, as it were, uh, uh, this uh, critical uh, debate and has something to say about Hal Foster. Then, of course, I mentioned of, uh, already George Marcus in anthropology, on the other hand, so in the contemporary arts you have the ethnographic turn. A li little bit earlier, following uh, Clifford uh, Geertz's hermeneutic turn in anthropology, a little bit later you get the writing culture critique, which is basically uh, a critique of, uh, if you like, of our practices of representation and of fieldwork. Yeah? This didn't have immediate, as it were, implications, perhaps for the museum, although then the Carp Levine uh, volume on exhibiting cultures was published. Um, but, uh, so it didn't have immediate um, implications for visual practices in anthropology. And George Marcus has also acknowledged that. But it did usher forth, if you like, uh, a number of experimental practices in ethnographic writing or ethnograph uh, anthropological writing proper. So you get a number of experimental ethnographies. Uh, you get the work, for example, uh, by Michael Tausig, which is very interesting to look into. Um, and um, overall, uh, you can say that, that both of these uh, streams of uh, uh, critical uh, revolutions, reformations, if you like, in their respective disciplines have led to a renewed emphasis on practice. And um, um, in the present, I think this revolves around uh, certain, uh, certain key issues, certain key topics of which I will feature two, number two and three. I will not speak so much about number one, which is more a discussion internal, I think, to anthropology and goes in a way. I'm speaking to the converted here already, as it were, people working in, in museums and, and with the visual. One has to do a very briefly that in anthropology, academic anthropology, there has been, and it has been acknowledged, uh, a, a great aversion, if you like, to the image. 
uh, and a great aversion to color, too, up until recently. Yeah, we are basically producing books and articles, and uh, if at all, we take some images as illustrations. This is especially true for, as it were, the British social anthropology uh, tradition, and uh, Anna Grimshaw has written at some length about this in the ethnographer's eye. Um, uh, whereas in, and of course also the separation historically in, in Britain in, in particular of uh, anthropology departments and museums whereas the American forefield approach had a larger integration of topics relating both to material culture and, and visual practices um, the difference or the separation was never as strong um, but uh, Lucien Casting Taylor who now leads the uh, Sensory Ethnography Laboratory at Harvard, uh, he has written in an article in the 1990s about the iconophobia of anthropology in this respect, uh, our supposed hate of uh, images. Yeah? But I will not go further into this, and as I say, I don't think anybody here shares this view, so I, I'm speaking to the converted. Uh, but uh, believe me, or <laughs> some of my colleagues still think in this way, and I think some of in inverted commas, mainstream anthropology is the uh, uh, But what is more interesting for us here is perhaps um, an engagement uh, more lately or a possibility of dialogue, if we think uh, of the speaking terms, could perhaps revolve around two things. One is the anthropology of the senses with contemporary art, and the other one is, uh, could be a dialogue or a conversation to be had around dialogical practice and ethics. Now, anthropology of the senses, as you know, uh, uh, broadly inspired by phenomenology, uh, perhaps two streams uh, to be identified, but I don't want to classify them too much. One uh, number of Canadian scholars, David House, Constance Clarsen, have put this on, on the map since the uh, 1990s, late 80s, 1990s. Um, uh, and another one, uh, more idiosyncratic, more standing alone, and not to be classified perhaps as an anthropology of the senses as such, but influenced by phenomenology, is the work of Tim Ingold. Mm -hmm. um, uh, philosophically, they come from different stands, partly from, uh, uh, from Melo Ponti, Ponti uh, and others. But in any case, this is now a large field. Many anthropologists, academic uh, anthropologists, anthropologists writing, uh, doing field work, analyzing their material and so forth, conceptually engaging, uh, and I will not go into the latest developments of ontology. Um, uh, but they are somewhat related, in some, there is some connection there as well. Um, uh, it, we have many of, of these works now which bring a new acknowledgement both of sensual practices in field work, but also of the senses of those we work with or the sensuous cultures we find as, as representations of others in fieldwork. Now this has an interesting relation to some work done in the contemporary arts and I will briefly speak about a work which is also featured in one of the books uh, Between Art and Anthropology of a Norwegian Icelandic artist based in Berlin, Sissel Tola who is really a chemist uh, by training, and she has, um, don't ask me how, because I'm, I'm not a chemist, uh, she has developed a method by which she can uh, capture smell, all kinds of smells. Yeah? Nice smells, but also malodorous <laughs> <laughs> smells. And one is uh, appropriately, called, uh, appropriately called the smell of fear, which she has uh, if you like, exhibit it in, in many parts of the world. And this consists of, here's first her method, she uh, makes emulsions with the smell she captures and then uh, uh, or distills them, puts them into an emulsion and paints the walls of a gallery. In the smell of fear, what she does, she has taken from 15 men who are um, anonymous to us, in a moment of fear or excitation, the, um, as it were, the perspiration, yeah? Uh, in, um, uh, under, under the armpit. Uh, imagine you're traveling in the metro, in the tube, yeah, and people are searching. You have these sometimes malodorous uh, smells and so forth, has captured them. And um, 
integrated them uh, um, uh, into her paint emulsions white and painted the walls of the literal uh, white cube a gallery. Yeah? Now instead of seeing something there you smell something and it's not very pleasant. Uh, so this is uh, uh, quite an interesting project. You, mi you, you might think just that this is uh, uh, um, uh, just for the sake of it, but it has interesting epistemological uh, implications. At one point, when I moved to, to Oslo to take up a professorship there, they, I, I convened uh, at, um, in 2007 actually on the premises of our um, sister institution of the Department of Anthropology of the Museum of Cultural History in the ethnographic section, I convened an international conference on contemporary art and anthropology. I invited Cecil Tollers to speak about this project, and I brought her together on the panel with one of our then PhD students, now he's finished, Christian Sörhau, uh, who had done fieldwork amongst the Varao of the Orinoco Delta. Now the Varro are riverine uh, people and, and they do uh, uh, fishing and other activities you do on, 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 a, on a delta, but they also in more recent times go to the big garbage dumps of the nearby cities. Uh, and he also showed, has done some field work there and he showed us pictures of course again like, like I do a slide projection. But in the conference, we discussed what an interesting project it, it could be if Cecil Tollers and he would work together and we would instead in an exhibition get these smells. Obviously, this would have to be developed further, but I think it would leave quite a different impact um, uh, and perhaps uh, would also be analytically different to be exposed in this way to other senses and sense perceptions. Yeah. So there you can perhaps see, this, this was never realized, this project. This was at the point uh, of, of discussing it. I now come to the uh, third point. I will jump, but you can see that in the last book, the very interesting work, uh, historically, in, in contemporary art of Elio Ortizica, a Brazilian artist uh, of the 1960s, uh, 50s, really, to the 80s. But um, I will leave this here. Um, how much time do we have? Because this will allow me... Uh, um, okay. I'm not going too fast. I will briefly... I already spoke about the uneven hermeneutics, if you like, in that field of um, speaking terms. Uh, of conversation, of dialogue with artists. And I will briefly mention a work, but you can read this up in an article I published in Critical Arts, from my own field work in Latin America, where I worked with young um, Argentine contemporary artists in a small village in the northeast of Argentina. Here, yeah. in the province. in the province of Corrientes on the Paraguayan border. Uh, and our idea was uh, together to document, uh, as it were, and to engage with, in a small village not far from the uh, provincial capital of Corrientes, the uh, procession of the patron saint, uh, Saint Anne, the mother of Mary, of Saint Mary, in this case. And uh, we had, on the premises of the local art museum, uh, uh, colonial style uh, building we, with very simple uh, means we uh, try together to make an installation here you see that with uh, sand uh, from the uh, village we had uh, uh, laid out the, the grid pattern typical grid pattern of, uh, of Latin American or Spanish uh, colonial cities and we marked with uh, thread and different colors uh, the, the procession uh, the church the red points are those of a local, uh, non-canonized, non-official popular saint, the Gauchito Pil, uh, uh, Gaucho figure. Um, and uh, we also uh, used uh, traditional bread, uh, we put, uh, which was sold in the, on the procession day, put on pedestals. Um, and this is the statue of that and carried through by people uh, during the procession, and uh, I've, I've been there on several occasions, and in the intervening year, one of the artists whom you see drawing here, Ada Irasposa, had uh, 
with the consent and the collaboration of the community, actually made a new dress uh, for St. Anne. <laughs> so she's not shown in the, the old dress, which I first encountered. I don't have the picture here now, the slide. Uh, which she first uh, wore when I, I came there. So there was collaboration and also long-term, durational, if you like, collaboration during uh, my absence. But I will not now here uh, reproduce the abstract, which are in the article of a conversation we had. That's why I called it Contested Grounds uh, with the artist, because this collaboration was actually quite difficult. We achieved something in the end, but... Um, uh, it was quite uh, difficult because the artist thought that I would uh, just take them perhaps as an intermediary uh, to get uh, my ethnographic research done on the local culture because they were more knowledgeable that I would take them just as uh, uh, mediators. We also had different uh, assumptions of what perhaps anthropology or ethnographic research uh, might be because I wanted to see how far their artistic uh, training and methods would produce something which would go beyond my note writing uh, and later writing for publication. Yeah. Nevertheless, we made a presentation in the local uh, museum and we also, uh, with another artist, a, a local video uh, artist, we had a double uh, video projection in the courtyard of the museum where he showed uh, a short uh, film which he had made of the procession but uh, cut uh, in, um, a cut very fast to the um, local form of music, the chamamé. Uh, five minutes? Two minutes? Okay. Two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay. Uh, we can maybe discuss that uh, later. What uh, this final part would, uh, should be about is really another field um, where I think anthropology and, and contemporary art should have a conversation and which has implications for the museum. Uh, um, and this is ethics. Uh, of course, in the museum, this has been uh, a big uh, uh, topic over the last decades uh, with the uh, work together with the source communities, but also very contentious issues of the return of objects, uh, including the return of human remains. I will not touch upon this because there are many specialists of you uh, are more than familiar with this and the UNESCO resolutions and so forth. Um, and the contemporary arts, of course, and this is why we are very aware of in anthropology that uh, we cannot speak from a moral high point when we engage with ethics um, yeah, and have a conversation with contemporary arts. All to the contrary, anthropology has a very complicated history because of colonialism with ethics. But we have nevertheless, at least the American Anthropological Association and other professional bodies, and the museums too, adopted codes of ethical standards and practices, whereas the arts have not. But that is not because they are less ethical than us, but that's because the arts do something different. They challenge often contingent notion of ethics and specifically transgress them. Very briefly, the work of Artur Zmijewski, a Polish artist, who had re-inscribed the, uh, uh, the uh, number um, uh, given to an inmate of, the, of a concentration camp, Nazi concentration camp during World War II, because he, with the consent of the person in a recent project, uh, he wanted to open the gates of uh, memory and to have uh, uh, the person talk about it. Uh, I will not go into details, you can look this up, but this is of course perhaps uh, very challenging uh, for us uh, and very uh, uh, provoking and we must ask ourselves to what ends uh, such a practice is done. Um, very finally, uh, 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 artists, I will uh, conclude now, um, also involve sometimes large-scale projects with communities and so-called relational art, a term from Nicolas Burio, uh, uh, relational aesthetics. and. Um, but, but sometimes it is not clear whether this is uh, just participation or whether it's collaboration. Another term we investigate in, in the last book, basing our discussion on a very interesting art historian, Grant Kester, who has uh, written at length about this in his last two books. And here's an example, Francis Alice, When Face Moves Mountains, where nearby Lima, um, in Peru, he has uh, volunteers, but from the city, this is near a shanty town actually, uh, move a part uh, of a sand dune. Yeah. Um, 
But Grant Hester in his uh, book, The One and the Many, uh, says actually uh, that these were just uh, brought in and didn't help so much, didn't involve the local community, uh, this project. Uh, so we have to see always very carefully, as in our own projects, uh, uh, what kind of collaborations these are artists in the new sort of socially inspired art, community art, relational art engaged with, and, and to what ends this is done. So in this sense, it remains very much an open dialogue, and we have to find those speaking terms in each instance. Thank you very much. Grazie moltissimo per questa meravigliosa comunicazione che ci ha aperto a me particolarmente in un'area non conosciuta che è giusto appunto il, il, 